Open your word this morning to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to continue a few weeks we've been doing now uh, true self-worth. We've been talking about self-worth and what Jesus has done for us and how we as believers can live a life of purpose with value, understanding who God has made us to be. Amen. How, how exciting is it to know that you are not junk, that you are not worthless, it seems in life sometimes that we go through uh, periods of life or periods of time where we might feel down about ourselves. We might have questions about, do I really have value? Is there really something that you need uh, me to do in this earth, Father? Uh, and and we, can, we can feel negative about ourselves. But it's so good to know that we are never valueless. <laughs> you have value all the time, no matter what you feel like. Uh, we talked about self-worth and how our need for self-worth factors into everything that, that happens in our life. Every strength that we have, every weakness that we have, every decision we make, and everything that we shy back from and, and decision we make not to do something uh, has a great deal to do with how you see yourself, how you feel about yourself. And I think we're going to finish this up today, I believe. Matthew chapter 15, verse... But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So the commandment of God or the word of God, why do you let your tradition keep you from obeying the word? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. <laughs> well, that's arrogance, isn't it? I'm the I'm your gift to the world. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So many times we make the, the word of God, the commandment of God, the, the beautiful um, life-giving resource that the Word of God is and everything that it provides for us. We make it so often of none effect by our tradition. Now think about that. Can you imagine for a second me walking in here and, and, and leading off by saying, hey, there's a way that you can live and all the promises of God, they're all yay and amen and all the things that you've heard me preach and teach over these last 10 years. I could say all that's true, but if you allow your tradition, the way you've thought about things, the way you've always done things, etc., if you allow those things to take the precedent, it will literally, I mean quite literally, make the word of God have no effect in your life. I'll submit to you this morning that making the word of God have no effect is the most expensive thing you can do. Making the word of God literally have no effect in your life is the most costly mistake that you could ever make. Turn to the book of Colossians. I like this verse of scripture. Now, in this book, now, we'll remember, example, okay? I, I think that I shared this last week or a couple weeks ago. I can't remember. But the tradition, the religious tradition, the religious idea that started with a group or a denomination of people, um, and it was about saints. Remember I, I shared about that a couple weeks ago? Saints. There is a group of people that think that if you live the right life, if there's a documented miracle and there's, there are other criteria and the people, after you die, after a certain number of years, there is a group of people who vote on it and if, if they all agree that you were a saint, then you'll be known forever after you're dead in this world <laughs> that you were Saint Anthony 
I'll just say that because there is a St. Anthony, right, in that religion. But here's the thing. Now, let me just keep your finger there in the book of Colossians. Uh, well, just look at right there before we go any further. Look at what verse 2 says. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. He wrote this letter to saints. Back up to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. Since we're going, just back on up to Ephesians. Since you guys brought this up. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, here Paul is. See, he didn't, he wrote all this thankfully before tradition could corrupt him. He wrote to the saints at Ephesus, to the saints at Colossae, to the saints at Philippi. He called us saints. Now, here's what tradition will do. Tradition takes a man-made system of some sort and puts a bunch of extra biblical rules and regulations that you've got to follow to be able to qualify for something. And it doesn't have any root. I mean, by the time it gets all twisted, right? It doesn't have any root, you know, in what the Word says. It's been twisted so much you can't even hardly identify what the original meaning of the Word said. And I've said this before, but when, you know, that, that word wicked, right? How many of you know that Satan is the wicked one? Amen? That word means twisted. It's how we get our word for wicker furniture. It's twisted. So he takes truth. And he twists truth to where it's so mangled up like your wicker furniture. You don't know, my goodness, if one of those pieces of wicker pops out, you don't know where to stick it back in. You don't know where it starts and stops. It's just all twisted together in a jumbled mess. That's what wickedness does in your life. It takes a truth because there is no truth in Satan. There's not an original anything in Satan. All he can do is pervert what God has made to be life and he takes it and destroys it and twists it somehow so you won't receive it. Because if you receive life, you've won. Amen. It's as simple as that. But if he can keep you from receiving, then you can't walk in the promises that he's got ordained for you. And it's tradition that does that. Since we're in the book of Colossians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Let's see here. I'm going to start with verse 1. I'm going to read this all together here, about seven or eight verses. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. A great conflict. Um, yeah, let's just keep reading. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding, full assurance of understanding. It's amazing what understanding will do for you. Amen? Wisdom, listen, I, I, I've shared this before, but everybody in this world has some measure of knowledge. And, I mean, if you've, if you've been around three or four days you already know subconsciously that when you cry, you'll get fed. I mean, a, a kid two days old already has some knowledge that he's gathered, right? Now, all the way up through, we can gather a whole bunch of knowledge. Now, wisdom, we're called to walk in the wisdom, the mind of Christ the, with the wisdom of God. Wisdom is higher than knowledge because wisdom is the ability to use knowledge. So knowledge is just a bunch of facts and figures and, and things that come and go. Remember, facts change all the time, but truth doesn't. So you, you, have a head, you can have a head full of knowledge and have no wisdom and you have no idea how to use the knowledge. It doesn't mean anything. But now here's the thing. After wisdom, Solomon said in, uh, in, in the book of Proverbs, in all you're getting, get understanding. So wisdom, understanding is a step past wisdom. It's where you have all the facts and figures, all the knowledge, and then you've got wisdom on how to use those, but then understanding, when understanding kicks in, it's more of a spiritual thing, and you can understand from down in your knower why it'll work, how it'll work. You'll have understanding of how the thing operates. 
Like if we, if we wanted to talk about a jet engine today, I might even be able to share some because I've read about them some. But we've got some people that work at GE Aircraft. We've got engineers in this room that are so much smarter than me that work on, I'm talking about the jet engines with the 15 foot diameter, you know, wow. I mean, I, it just way beyond my comprehension, the amount of power, the thrust that that stuff can just, it just blows me away. But I could talk a little bit about a turbine engine versus something else versus a prop motor and all this kind of stuff. But, but now you, you talk to the person that invented it, that understands it, and he can feed you the ins and the outs of not only what goes into it to make it work, but why those things make it work and the laws of physics and all the other things that go into play that'll make that turbine work. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So understanding, when you're, when you're operating in understanding, I'm talking about spiritual understanding now, it so supersedes mere knowledge, it supersedes just wisdom, but two steps below, it so supersedes mere knowledge that sometimes it overrides knowledge. Now, why is that? Because knowledge, you can't figure out the mind of God. So you cannot put, sometimes, this will just blow some of us away here this morning. Sometimes with God, two plus two equals five. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. One puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. Now explain God's math. <laughs> you can't explain God's math. You take a couple of these truths over here and a couple of these truths over here, you don't have four truths operating. You got 24 truths operating in your life all of a sudden. And God's got things in play and his Holy Spirit is, is moving on the situation and there's other things happening that you don't deserve. It's his unmerited favor. It's his undeserved mercy. It's, my goodness, there's so many things going on in your life. You can't figure out how to do it. That's why it's so much better to live the kingdom way versus the mammon way. You can't serve God in mammon. The mammon way will try to figure all of it out, and when it gets to the end of its rope and can't figure it all out, you'll want to commit suicide. That's good. Come on, somebody. Yeah. But now with the understanding and the mind of Christ and the knowledge of God, understanding exactly how these things work, now all of a sudden, talk about being able to parent with understanding. Yes. When your child comes in and says, why? It's not just because you live under my roof and it's going to be that way till you turn 18. Now you have understanding on why they're asking why. Now listen to me for a second. And you step over into a place of compassion where you don't just see the problem from your angle, you see it from that little seven-year-old's angle. And you're not selfish enough to think it's all about you, but it's really about them. They're asking why because they need to know. You already know, so you need to see it through their eyes. So to have the understanding and the compassion to be able to be on this level as a parent but operate in this level and make it so easy that they can understand it. And not only that they understand it, but that they want to fall over backwards and do cartwheels to help you. I come over here for a second. Does anybody have any kids over here that need to hear this? All right. Listen, you cannot, you cannot figure out, if you try to figure out everything, you're going to absolutely end up in a loony bin somewhere. I'm being serious. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, uh, that I don't know everything. That should have got so many more amens. <laughs> if Jennifer was sitting in here, she'd be amening me. That's the first, yeah, when I was 13, I knew everything. My dad knew nothing, and you guys, are, you guys are very familiar with what Mark Twain said about that. By the time he turned 21... How smart his dad became in those seven years, right? From 14 to 21. It's a, it's a principle that we see the, because the parents have wisdom and understanding where kids are only just trying to gather all the knowledge they can and they're trying to do their best. But that's why we got to teach them, just like he wrote in the book of Proverbs, incline your ears to wisdom and all you're getting, get understanding. This is the reason, this is how you grow up. Amen? All right. Now let's continue here. Verse 2 of Colossians 2. I didn't forget where we were. That their hearts might be comforted. Now, he has conflict for these people so that these people that he's writing this letter to would understand these things. Now you understand the great uh, compassion Jesus had when he's on the cross and he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They, don't even, they didn't even have the knowledge. They just were obeying an order. Put these spikes in that guy's wrist. 
They were just obeying order. They had no idea what they were doing. If they did, if the enemy understood it, if he had understanding, he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. If he only knew. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to all and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, so there's how wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, those all three are in those two verses of Scripture. Go home and read, go home and let the Holy Spirit show you those things. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now watch, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to have full assurance that in Christ, in whom, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he's yearning for them that they would get this understanding and not fall prey to verse four. He said, I'm saying all of this, lest or so that it, no man can beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, Yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. There's supposed to be order in a body of believers. Amen? Amen. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. Here's the key. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So as you, just the same way, put verse six back on the screen, please. In the same way that you received the Lord Jesus, in the very same way that you received him, you're supposed to walk in him. As you've received Christ the Lord, so walk you in him. You don't receive the Lord Jesus by faith. It's the same thing in different words that he wrote to the church at Galatia, right? Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You began in the spirit, now you're trying to be made perfect in the flesh. He's saying the same thing to this church. He's saying to them, you began in Christ Jesus the correct way, so continue walking in him that way. How? Rooted and built up in him. Yeah. Yes, amen. Yeah. amen? Yes, amen. Now, verse 8. I love this verse. Beware. I'm going to say it with authority, like if Paul was saying it to the church at Lebanon, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Lebanon. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Deceit that is rooted in vanity, in them being right. After the, watch this word, tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, oh, and not after Christ now. He's, he is talking about Jesus, but he's talking about Christ. There are different times in the word, I'm not going to get into this right now, where Christ is literally referring to Jesus. Here it's referring to what Christ, Christ was in his last name. Remember, it means the anointed one in his anointing. He's talking about the anointing. You cannot go after vain deceit, the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world, and not about the anointed thing, the anointing itself that'll remove burdens, destroy yokes, make sure he'll see to it that you walk this thing out how you need to walk it out, not how somebody else says you need to walk it out. Amen. Amen. Yes. See, that's, that's where it gets tricky because when people think that they have the answer, I mean, it doesn't start out kooky, but after years, it gets kooky. The person that is on TV selling holy water from the River Jordan that probably came out of a tap for ab absolutely free for a gift of $125. <laughs> absolutely free for your gift. of That person, I'm not just, I'm, understand, I'm not saying this just to make fun. I'm saying this because that person didn't start out like that. It's one thing after another, after another, after another, that after 30 years, you find yourself, it's so wicked not that he's a wicked person. I'm not even having anybody in mind. I don't even know who does that or whatever. I've just seen stuff like that. I'm just saying that person is not necessarily wicked, but the enemy has gotten in there and twisted so many, so many things like that wicker furniture. He has a heart. He's trying to do the things of God, and he has no idea that it has nothing to do with selling vials of water from the River Jordan. Amen. One degree. That's right, because just like, I mean, we've got some 
How many people in here, okay, I'm gonna pick on somebody else. I'm gonna pick on the Schneider boys. These guys can shoot. I wanna go shooting with you guys. And these guys, talk about quick, accurate. I've seen videos of these guys on Facebook hitting targets like so many in like 20 seconds. I mean, it's ridiculous how these guys are fast. I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty good shot when I set up, <laughs> you know, I'm, a, I'm okay, but these guys are good. Like they're, are you guys considered marksmen? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that, I don't know what that is. And they're like, yeah, probably. <laughs> they're humble. They don't want to talk about themselves. But I'm just saying this. So what happens if you're off just a half of a degree? Just a half of a degree. Well, not nothing much if you're only 20 yards away. But what if you're doing some long range stuff with a sniper rifle? I've got a buddy that used to be a, a cop here in Lebanon. And I'm friends with him on Facebook. I did some work with him, oh, 20 years ago. But he uh, has retired and he lives out, in, or he's out in Wyoming a lot. I don't know if he lives out there. But anyway, he hunts coyote and stuff. And he's got videos. I'm talking, I mean, you want to sit and waste an hour and just be like, whoa, <laughs> that's cool. He has videos of him shooting coyote and stuff. Ranchers out there will hire him. And he's got these, I mean, ultra powerful, long range. I don't even know what caliber these things are. But I'm telling you what, he'll set up a, He's got videos of these things, and it's sighted in like at three and four hundred yards, five hundred yards. Some of them are crazy. I mean, long way away, and he hits them right in the heart. Oh my. I mean, he hits them right in the heart, right where he's supposed to. These ranchers hire them to kill these animals, to so their herds. You know, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So this isn't killing things just to kill things, but it's for a purpose. Getting those predators out of the ranch. So, but what happens if he? From 20 yards, it's not a big deal. But what happens if you're one degree off from 500 yards? I mean, he, I don't know, don't have time to do the math, but he's going to be, he's going to aim here and hit that wall over there, right? From that far away. Now that's what happens. One degree off in the beginning, it doesn't look like you're that far off. Everything looks like it's okay. But you see yourself or you, you stop and you look at yourself five, 10 20 years down the road and you're thinking, how am I so off in the way I parent my kids? How am I so off in the way that things are going? And sometimes, now there's restoration, there's the restoration of all things, but sometimes it could be too late in that area. So you gotta, now you gotta rely on the mercy of God to come back in and say, give me revelation knowledge. I, I shouldn't say that, it's never too late, but you've got to then attack it from a different way. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's like, um, you guys have heard me say this, getting healed is awesome. In your physical body, staying healthy and whole is much better. Yes. Amen. So while you're healthy, while you're whole, speak to your mind every day and speak to your eyes and your ears. Just declare the blessing of the Lord over your entire body before you need a miracle. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Learn, learn to live that way, totally focused and reliant on Jesus. Amen. On the everyday things, not just when it becomes a crisis sometime. So beware that people don't get you over into the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, verse nine says, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the man Christ Jesus, not only in his body, but in the body of Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Literally, in the body of Christ, all the fullness is yours. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Ephesians, I'll... I'll End here, Ephesians chapter 2. Praise the Lord Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, these are coming right out of the verses that say that you were saved by faith. Uh, but, uh, well, I'll, let me read it. By grace you're saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Were his workmen created in Christ Jesus, what? Unto good works. So we're created for the good works. Good works don't make us right. His righteousness prepares us to do good works. Amen? Big difference. Wherefore, verse 11 says, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, why that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, without the anointed one, without the anointing, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's how they were before they met Jesus. Now watch this. But now in Christ Jesus, the anointed one, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of that anointed one. Amen. Glory be to God. Now without Christ means without the anointing. At one point in time, you were without the anointing. And how did he describe that? 
in verse 11. Uh, excuse me, verse 12. You were without the anointing, being aliens. Now here's where I want to finish up this series on true self-worth, value. You are valuable. Have you got anything out of this series over the last few weeks? You are valuable. And here's what I want you to know. Aliens, an alien means being somewhere that you have no authority to dwell and no rights to be there. It's being somewhere where you have no authority to dwell there and you have no rights there. I just took that out of the dictionary. That's what an alien is. So for him to say that you, when you were without the anointing, you were aliens, absolutely. Let me read it again. Somewhere you have no authority to dwell and no rights to be there. That's what you were, where? From the commonwealth of Israel. Now, the true, the true Israel, not remember Romans chapter nine, not all that are of Israel, of the nation, are of the true Israel. The true Israel, you, if you're in Christ Jesus, you are an inhabitant of the true Israel. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, somebody. And there is a common wealth in that kingdom system that allows you to get everything you need. All the value you need comes from that. It doesn't come from you putting yourself in a place. Only the anointing can do that. Being in Christ puts you in a place where you are a partaker of the commonwealth of Israel puts you in a place where all your needs are supplied. That's how it happens, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll say this. We have a right to be a citizen of the household of God. We live in the kingdom. A kingdom is the domain where the king has dominion and authority. You live in the kingdom. Our king of kings, the Lord Jesus, has total dominion and authority and has every right to carry out the kingdom will and purpose as he sees fit and he sees fit to do it through you. Oh, come on, somebody. Talk about true self-worth. Once you understand this, once you understand where you've been seated, what you've been made to be, that you are a citizen of the household of God, that everything inside of you has been put there by the Heavenly Father pertaining to life and godliness, there's no thing, there's not one thing, nothing, no thing, not one thing that you ever need to live out a life full of his provision that you've got to wait 20 years from to get on the inside of you. Now, this is why it's important that he who is, uh, he who is faithful over little, God makes ruler over much because it's all already in there, Erica. It's already in there, Shayla. Everything that you need is in there. He's not going to put more on the inside of me, but here's what happens. When you're faithful over that, and it's not just, we don't just talk about seed when it's offering time. I'm talking about seed now. The whole thing is about seed time and harvest. He put in me a, a, a measure of the gift of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love. As I cultivate love, my goodness, it comes back on me in every wave. As, I don't need more peace in my life. I need to be peace. He's already made, he's already given me his peace. And so I don't waller around crying every day. When's there going to be peace in my home? When you stand up on the word of God and declare your home to be a place where his peace has complete, total authority. Peace comes back on you on every wave. So it's being a steward over what he's made you to be. Now you understand that when you're faithful over that little, he makes you ruler over much because when you learn how to dominate the world system because you live in the kingdom, that's the dumb D-O-M part, kingdom. I dominate because of the king. Amen. It's not haughty. It's not arrogant. Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. And when I'm on his side, I don't have to worry about all the sides. I know that he has taken over. And so it does sickness, disease, lack of any kind does not even belong in anywhere in my circle of influence. It can't be there. Right. It cannot be there. And the more you cultivate that, now all of a sudden, that's how a person becomes ruler over much in a kingdom place, a kingdom position. That's when you, when you cultivate those little things. The gifts of the Spirit, for example, they're given severally as he wills, it says, right? In the book of 1 Corinthians. Until you can be faithful over the love that he's shed abroad in your heart. 
I saw a meme. Have you, <laughs> have you guys all seen those white cat memes going around Facebook? Those things are hilarious. Those are, things are hilarious. Chris sent me one the other, or Priscilla, I don't know who it was. They sent me one the other day that on the left side, you guys have seen them. The left side says, I want to go on a mission trip. And the cat's on the other side saying, you won't even work in the nursery. <laughs> you want to go take Jesus around the world, but you ignore the least of these. You've got, you've got a seed planted on the inside of you. It was given there. It was put in there for you to share with the world. Yes. Start with 10 people or 100 people. One. Start with one person. Yes. Start with one. Wake up tomorrow morning. Wake up tomorrow morning. It's not too late today, you know. But wake up tomorrow morning and start your day saying, Lord, I just believe for the wisdom. When the, when the one person comes up in front of me at the gas station or the restaurant or the grocery store or at work or in line picking up my kids at school, whatever it is, when the one person that I need to share your love with comes up today, I'm going to be a good steward over one. And don't roll your eyes when somebody starts sharing with you all the stuff that's negative that's happening in your life. And you just start looking at your watch thinking, it's three more minutes until school's out. And just kind of, you know, body language kind of turn aside. You just kind of carry on a conversation like you don't want to talk to them. Because that's the person that God gave you today. <laughs> that's the one person. Don't you know that he loves them as much as he loves you? Do you really believe it? Amen. That's compassion. Amen. And you have enough value on the inside of you. You have enough self-worth on the inside of you to make the right decisions, to do the thing. Remember, it all that, that need for self-worth will factor into every decision you make, every strength, every weakness. We can turn every weakness that the enemy would consider a lack when you start to see yourself complete in Christ Jesus. Anything that the enemy thinks is a weakness all of a sudden becomes a strength of yours. Amen. And the thing that the enemy meant for harm, God can turn it around for good. Glory to God. And you can bless people that you just never even dreamed of. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Did that minister to somebody? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.